That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi, I'm Sipar2. Welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. And just because someone asked, Dan the Lizard is still in the videos. He's just in a ridiculously bright spot of the camera. Um, so if he does something, then you get to see it. But he's a lizard. He probably won't. He's kind of chill. Um, anyway. Don't give me that look. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the book uh, this week that I was most excited for. I've been um, waiting for this to come out ever since it got announced. Uh, and it is it is pretty damn cool. I have a couple complaints about it and stuff, and I'll get into that. But this is just a really exciting thing. The only thing I want more to happen than a Green Lantern Star Trek crossover is a Green Lantern Doctor Who crossover. And the only thing I want more than that is a Green Lantern Star Wars crossover. The Doctor Who one is still a distinct possibility, but more than anything else, I don't think the Star Wars one will ever happen now that Disney's bought it. But, you know, it's, it's always possible. Um, in any case, though, this in and of itself is so much fun. It's like, it's, it's still an intro setup issue, but it's got a lot of, like, what the hell's going on moments. Um, just, like, getting, you know, building the, the suspense and the tension and everything. And it doesn't take much. There's... It, it's it's quite a bit of dialogue for such a short book, and that's my biggest complaint is, all right, let's, you know, spoilers, okay? Here's the staple page. The staple page of a comic book is, by and large, the middle of the book, where wherein the, 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 the pages had to be stapled so you have an even dis distribution of pages. All right, so after the staple page, we have one, two, three three pages and then the story's over. Um, and that's kind of disappointing. Uh, and, and then the rest of it's just ads and, and letting you know what's coming. I suppose I like that because there's no ads in the beginning of it. Um, or, or throughout the entire story, there are no ads other than the cover page. Um, the inside cover page. There are no ads. So I guess... I'm not sure if I'm getting either a normal comic book with the ads put at the end, or if I'm getting a very short comic book where, you know, half the book is ads. Um, but I was, I was pretty disappointed by that part of it. But that's honestly a good thing overall, because that means I was enjoying the book so much that one, I didn't even realize it wasn't, excuse me, that it wasn't being interrupted. And two, I'm left wanting a lot more. And they do a lot to set up. I mean, on this, this spread page is when all the Green Lantern stuff starts happening. Um, the, the intro to it is this guardian being chased by some kind of unknown voice that looks like the, uh, the voice of Necron, but we'll see. Um, and he's claiming that the, uh, that the entire Green Lantern Corps, as well as all the other Corps I'm meant to assume, has been wiped out. That's really interesting. The Guardian ends up transporting himself out, and then it's another time, another universe, and that's how we get the Star Trek thing. Honestly, I was kind of hoping... I know it wouldn't have made any goddamn sense, but you know what? It's a crossover book. It doesn't have to fit. I was kind of hoping they would have just had the balls to say that Star Trek was just in the future. Um, <laughs> that'd have been pretty sweet, but... Oh, well. Drat. Um... Maybe we can get Batman and Beyond in that that whole universe. We could fill out a timeline there. Um, but this is just really fun. You got you know class. These are the movie versions of the characters, but it all still does fit. I've been watching Star Trek lately, and I've finished all the TOS stuff with the exception of uh, Star Trek Generations. That's the one thing TOS I haven't seen. Not counting, of course the animated series which i don't plan to watch after watching the first episode um i'm sure i can be forgiven for that but like they they read both like the original characters and like the movie characters um or movie versions of the characters you know scotty's got his little miniature assistant friend thing there uh get closer um but yeah it's just basically what the premise is is that the Enterprise crew has found um, a dead Guardian's body and all the rings, with the exception of the Green Lantern ring. Uh, and then they're in the middle of being, like, they're about to be attacked by, what's this guy's name again? Um, General Chang. I think this is the guy from 
from Undiscovered Country, but I could be mistaken. Um, I'll have to, like, I've only seen the movies once. I'm not going to purport to be a huge fan. But, um, yeah, so, like, they, they're being hailed by that guy, and their shields are dropping due to the rings escaping. The rings are going and selecting people, uh, both on the Enterprise crew and, uh, Yellow Ring, of course, went to, to General Chang there. Um, so I guess the, the premise is that everyone's going to get a ring with the exception of the Green Lantern um, being Hal Jordan still. Um, so that's all cool. I, I'm enjoying that part of it, but it's there's really not a lot here. I just described the plot, you know, a couple minutes there. That's, that's not a lot going on yet. Um, that's okay because it's still a really exciting, really fun issue. Um, the character interaction is written well. Spock has some fun lines and stuff. Um, Spock and Kirk is always the best part of watching anything TOS. And McCoy has one just absolutely hilarious line. So they find the dead Guardian's body. And then, all right, all right, here we go. They bring him up to the ship. Sick bay. Well, he's dead. Well, he's dead, Jim. He's been dead for a while. That's, that's just great McCoy writing. Um, well... Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a doctor. Oh, wait, I'll get right on that. Um, so, yeah, we get, you know, Klingon ship to cloaking. It's it's very, this book feels more Star Trek than it does Green Lantern so far, so that's interesting. Um, I, I I don't know what else to really say. I'm excited for it. It's, it's fun so far. It's only six issues. Um, I'm still a little disappointed that, like I said, it's not as... Um, it's not as meaty as I'd hoped, especially for a three ninety nine book. It's just really short, and then you get a lot of ads, which is disappointing. Um, but you know, we'll see. I'm I'm sure it'll uh, it'll get more dense as it goes on. I mean, it's Star Trek; it has to. Amazing Spider Man: Renew Your Vows Number Two. This is getting good. Um. Like I said, the last issue, it could have stood on its own fairly well. But this is showing the consequences of Peter Parker not being Spider-Man and then the consequences coming back from that. And and it's just, it's delving into the whole um, secret war world or whatever they're calling it. What, what do they call this? Uh, the fragments of worlds that no longer exist maintained by the Iron Wilds. A ma oh, battle world, there we go. Battle worlds. Um, that's interesting enough, I suppose. Uh, it's weird that it's almost... It, it's not the exact same premise. I'll be fair. But it is so similar to what's going on in Convergence. I just... I don't know who came up with it first. Um, I just... I find that really funny. In any case, um, Peter Parker dealing with responsibilities. Uh, it's... You know, you can tell he kind of hates living in this world, but he's he's made sacrifices for his family. And that's, I mean, it's a classic Spider-Man thing. You, you try to both live up to your own personal feelings of responsibility and also to the, uh, to the expectations of you, um, both in the family context and the social context. So that's always, always really great stuff. Um... And this handles it really well. I was talking to Manos a little bit, and he he has banned, um, or he has a ban on anything Peter Parker Spider Man until they go back on one more day, and that's what this is. It's going back on one more day. It's an alternate universe wherein Peter Parker stayed with his family, um, or Peter Parker got to keep his family. A uh, little girl that has superpowers, spider powers. That's always cool. Um, I really like this this one little detail. So, um, she's sleeping on the uh, ceiling because she was afraid that there was something under her bed, a monster under her bed kind of thing. That's really cool. I like that idea. You know, what would a kid with spider powers do? Well, they, that seems like one of the things. Um, that's really funny to me. And this is, it's its well handled. It's great to see Peter Parker be a father and, and be, you know, a concerned parent. And then when he finds out that that his daughter might be in trouble, he immediately uh, forgets all about his, um, his need to hide or whatever. Well, not completely forget about it. So he just, he runs across the city with um, his hoodie 
hold shut, which is really cool. Um, I, I was really happy with this issue. It is a, a really good um, issue, and it deals with a lot of personal things for Peter Parker, which is great. And I was I was a little surprised that I didn't see him kill any villains. Um, I really expected that to happen. Like, you know, at the end here, he's facing off against Rhino and um, Boomerang Guy and some kind of uh, Wasp Lady. And I was, I was expecting him to kill one of them, but he doesn't. Uh, he lets him get out. And with, with the turn that we saw at the end of the last issue with him either killing Venom or, in this case, or, or letting Venom die, or in this case where we see at the beginning of this issue perhaps actively killing him, um, or at the very least not only letting him die but actively not helping him to survive, um... I'm really curious to see where they go with this. Uh, I, so I was, I was surprised not to see him k kill one of the villains off. So that they couldn't report back exactly what was going on to their uh, the boss. The main villain in this book I'm still kind of curious about. We haven't really gotten to... S we haven't really had the chance to see him do anything in particular. He kind of just sits there and looks intimidating. Um, and, you know, you keep in the back of your head that he's killed the Avengers... And I'm like, okay, but we didn't really see you kill the Avengers. Like, that's an issue in and of itself, you know? And and it's just kind of happening in the background of the first issue. So maybe that happened and I didn't see it in, in one of the other books, to be fair. Oops. Um. So I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But as is, like, he just looks really cool. And, and it's one of those things where, well, he did this thing. Yeah, sure, but... For me to feel that oomph, you really need to show that, um, and and show it in a big way, and at least in this book on its own, it's it's not happening. Uh, regardless, though, the uh, the Venom cover is really cool. Um, I really enjoyed this though. It's it's got a lot going for it. Um, and if you were one of those people like Manos who felt betrayed by the one more day thing, then this is the book to be picking up. Um, and it's just it's cool to get to see Spider Man deal with man things um i like that because he's always kind of been you know the high school kid and and it was regression of his character to bring him back to that so i, I like that he's he's dealing with issue like proper issues in this um good good issue pretty good week overall um still not loving this this is better than the last issue it, it did feel a lot more unique to me um, which is always a good thing when I'm reading Scott Snyder's stuff, because this is well written overall. There's there's a couple scenes in this that I like. Um, it's just, it's still just not my thing. I don't know. I'll get off Scott Snyder for a sec though, just because I want to bring this up. Oh, let me find a panel. Come on. Eh. I really don't like that Commissioner Gordon looks like Rorschach. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that bothers me. Uh, it's it's weird. They they talk about it. He shaves his mustache for this for being Batman, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. It just makes him look like Rorschach the way he's, he's got his head, this old punk rock thingy. Um, I don't know. Overall, I just this is okay. It's just not really my thing. Is what it's coming down to on this issue. Um, it's still well written, well handled, and everything. You have this. Uh, Fairly clever, last-minute thing. Um, feels very Hal Jordan uh, at the last minute there with the, the trick he pulls with the Batmobile. Um, overall, though, this just isn't for me, I think. Um, they're, they're building to this idea that, that he can't be what Batman is because that's different from person to person, and he just has to do what he feels is right. Which is constraining, given that he's in this whole corporate thing, and um, he's trying not to um, not be Batman. So or he's he's not allowed to be Batman and do in that sense of doing what he feels is right. So there's there's an interesting enough dilemma there. Um, I don't really care for the ish the the reveal at the end that Bruce Wayne is a janitor. Um, it's weird to 
kill off a character two, three issues ago and then bring him back. Or, wait, is it three? Two issues ago and then bring him back. Um, I don't know. That's I, To be fair, that sounds like a DC mandate thing, but I've seen this bat suit showing up on all the covers. It's in, you know, Batman, Superman. It's in all these other Batman books, uh, or books where Batman is. It's It's been this suit, so I can't imagine that DC is is actively retrograding that. So I'm assuming that the, the stinger here at the end, the twist reveal, is, is building up to something, but it would have... I, I can't help but feel like it would have been more effective if we'd had, like, you know, a little bit of a waiting period before showing Bruce Wayne again. Uh, just a couple issues really doesn't feel like that that big of an impact. Um, and you gotta remember about me, just my, one of my big, like, personal sticking points on things has always been just bringing a character back. Um, for me, once you kill a character, leave him dead. And if you're gonna bring him back, make it a big deal. And so far, no. Um, it's just, it, it makes it feel cheap. It make, I don't like death feeling cheap. Uh, that always bothers me. And, and I mean, it's the trope is called comic book death at this point. So I get that I'm kind of in the wrong medium. Um, if that's a thing, but that's why it's a thing. It's because it's so... Death, death is just so inconsequential, and I don't like that. Um, death needs to mean something for it to have that impact on you. And for it to have that impact, it needs to mean something. Um, you can't just have death be an on-off switch for characters. It's like, okay, we need this guy out of the book for a couple weeks or months or whatever, so we'll just kill him uh, and then bring him back later. Well, no. I'm not okay with that, but... We'll see where it goes here. Um, that's just a general thing for me. I'm not saying it's a huge problem in here. It's just, this is just part of the disease. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not problematic in and of itself. Uh, it's just something that, that bothers me anyway. Uh, I like the bit with the kids playing with toys, though once we see how old they are at the end, where they're arguing about it over, over which Batman is the real Batman or who's the real Batman... I don't know. They look a little too old to me. These here's the kids. All right. So at the beginning, they're they're arguing between a big action figure of the Jim Gordon Batman and the cla uh, an action figure of the classic Bruce Wayne Batman. And then, you know, they're arguing which one's Batman. He doesn't have Batmobile. Blah blah blah. And then we get this reveal at the end of who's having the argument, and they look like at least thirteen to fourteen year olds, where they're too old to be to be bringing action figures to school at least um and don't get me wrong i'm not judging on that i've got legos all around the damn apartment right now um you just can't see it because my window's there i'd love to be able to flip the camera around 180 degrees but there's a big window that would create backlight um so all you get is this side of the apartment where we purposefully did not decorate it in stuff um but overall, this book, on the whole, I, I enjoyed more than the last couple. Uh, especially Endgame, obviously. Um, it's Scott Snyder, though. It's probably just not for me, is, is what it's coming down to. Even when it's well done, it's just not my kind of thing. Alright, so let's go ahead and go on to trades. So this is Spider-Man The Birth of Venom, which was something I've been wanting to read for a very long time. Um, Venom's always been one of those characters where I just, I've really liked him ever since I saw him as a kid. And it's so weird to me as an adult to know that he didn't show up until the 90s because it just seems like such an obvious thing to do with Spider-Man is give him a bigger, stronger, bad guy version of himself. I mean, you know, there's, there's that version of the character for almost everybody in comic books. Green Lantern has Sinestro. Um, you know, Superman has Bizarro. Or, you know, it's just everyone has something like that. Even Hulk eventually got, you know, or Hulk has Abomination. So it's just kind of like an evil version that's that's bigger and stronger in some way, shape, or form than the original character. And, you know, it's done to varying degrees 
it's done well and, and bad and you know it's case by case basis but in this um just the idea of creating venom is is a really cool thing i love love the alien costume um that's such a great idea it's a little disappointing to find out that it just happens so by accident like you know it's always been i i like the way that it was done in the uh the spider-man animated series wherein uh it came off the plane and or not the plane the uh the shuttle after spider-man saved it and he thought it was just river muck and so he took it home to wash and stuff but here it's he goes into a room to get a new costume <laughs> and it just turns out to be an alien he like uses the wrong machine and it just gives him this symbiote alien costume um and it's whatever it's it's kind of conceited it takes up less than two pages of the book um but yeah i was, I was kind of surprised by that uh that that being the original origin so i think I, if i had to rank them i'd probably go animated series original animated series being one of the best i haven't seen it in spectacular spider-man um I, I need to watch that show. Uh, so I'd probably say uh, Spider-Man the Animated Series from the 90s, probably the best I've seen. Then I'd say the alien costume. Then I'd say Spider-Man 3, since it's like the most coincidental thing ever. Just Meteor Falls, and it happens to be the thing that can latch on Spider-Man's powers. We don't explain that there's alien life. We don't even kind of deal with that part of things. Um... So Spider-Man 3, like many things, near the bottom. What's worse, Ultimate Spider-Man. Watched that lately, too. Bit on a Spider-Man kick, like I said, and especially a Venom thing. So I watched a bit of uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, and I like at least that they're they're building Venom up as a thing. But mm, it's it's not very well handled. Um, like I said, I do want to watch... Uh, spectacular spider-man because i've i've heard nothing short of great things about that show to be fair i like the animation in ultimate spider-man a little bit better um i i call ultimate spider-man spider-man's new group because they do the exact thing of emperor's new group where they stop and have the character narrate uh just for jokey bits it's, it's almost like straight out of new groove <laughs> um but anyway birth of venom in and of itself so let's be fair here this almost should not be called the birth of venom um i went and got a hold of or i i was looking at the comic shop while looking for this and i found the alien costume saga and i realized a lot of it was um the same issues so i picked this up instead but here's the divide all right this section is all alien costume stuff this is the stuff that's kind of related to Venom. And honestly, Venom is... He's in it, but it's sporadic. Um, very sporadically involved in this. Uh, so I was kind of disappointed by that side of things. Um, there's also a very just drastic shift in tone. Um, obviously, the writer changes. Good thing? One sec, sorry. Obviously, the writer changes in this between um, a lot of the alien costume stuff and when we start getting Venom. But it's... Oh my god, it's like night and day, guys. Um, there's this scene with Mary Jane. Okay, yeah, this page with Mary Jane right here where she starts to strip in their new apartment to, to get Peter in the mood um, while he takes pictures of her. Whatever, you guys do what you want. But... You know, just a couple chapters, issues earlier, we got Mary Jane, you know, pouring out her soul to to Peter Parker in the park where we find out about her history and just, you know, how our father abandoned them and all this stuff. Um, it's really just this, this really heartfelt issue. Okay, so like, here's the page where that happens. And here's the section of book where, where Mary Jane's pouring out her heart. And let's get to the end of where she's pouring out her soul to Peter Parker. Uh, okay. So there's the sections of pages 
between Mary Jane tearfully pour, pouring out her heart to Mary Jane stripping in an apartment. Um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with either of those things, particularly the latter, but it's just such a drastic shift in tone from writer to writer um, that it's, it's really surprising. So honestly, I don't think that Birth of Venom is really the po- proper name for this, and I'll, I'll get to more of why later, but this is really condensed alien saga stuff with Venom in it, um, which is obviously kind of disappointing. Um, but, but you could argue, of course, that the alien saga stuff is Venom's origin, and I agree, but if you're going to call, it's only one side of the origin, though. If you're going to call something Birth of Venom, you need to show the Eddie Brock stuff. And the Eddie Brock stuff isn't in here at all. The first time you see Eddie Brock is when he's already been Venom. Um, like, hold on. I was just there. I should have kept the page. Sorry. Um, Spider-Man gets rid of the costume. On page 224 is when the costume leaves. The next page is... Uh, the next page over after we flip we get the the train scene with Venom well we flip to the next page and and Eddie Brock's already fused with the the symbiote and and on a vendetta against Spider-Man we don't get anything of Eddie Brock hating Peter Parker or Spider-Man for that matter um so it just feels really out of nowhere when he shows up and so the motivations for venom comes entirely from the alien costume the symbiote and that's fine but at the same time it's just it's disappointing not to get both sides particularly in such a thick volume i mean if you're already going to go this thick what's two or three more issues because they explain what peter parker has done to piss off eddie brock um in a couple issues like, they, they say what he did and stuff, but it's kind of hard to get through it without seeing it. One thing I guess I like about Spider-Man 3... Hold on a sec. I might as well grab it since we're sitting here talking about it so much. Spider-Man 3 is, is a movie with no end of issues, particularly when you look at the Venom stuff. I mean, I just explained one. We just don't even kind of address that there are fucking aliens in this universe. Um, but, I mean, there's there's no... There's no end to the issues with this movie. But one of the things I think it did really well is build in Venom's origin in that, you know, he doesn't just... The, the symbiote doesn't just randomly attach itself to someone because it felt rejected and then go after Spider-Man. The person it attaches itself to is a victim of Spider-Man because of the symbiote. And that's really fascinating, really well-built stuff. You know, uh, as poorly as Eddie Brock's motivations were handled in that movie, I do like the idea of giving him motivation against Spider-Man that isn't completely random and dependent upon himself. I like that part of it is Spider-Man's fault. Uh, Spider-Man in the Venom symbiote. Um, that's, That's a really good thing. This was the original source material, so obviously adaptation, you always have the advantage of getting to see what didn't work. But what what's so weird about it is just this has the choice of what to collect, and it doesn't even feel the need to collect Eddie Brock's stuff. So I have to assume that that stuff isn't going to help make it any better. Um, overall, I still like it, though. It's still fun to read, and it's I think it's important to read. If you like Venom, I think you should read this. Um, it's just not as, as good as I'd hoped it would be. Um, what else? Oh, one little detail I forgot to mention about this is, uh, this, the Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows issue. There's this bit at the end here where MJ gives Peter the black costume again. And he says, MJ, I promised I'd never wear that again. And what I like about that as we go to the end here, toward the end, rather, and here's MJ's line. I, I didn't mean to snap at you, Peter, but you're right. I am upset. Only it's not because of you. It's because of, well, that. After all we've been, after all we've both been through, I don't think on 
ever, I'll ever feel comfortable around that costume. And so Peter Parker takes off the black costume and throws him in the fire, and MJ gives him the red and blue costume. And in this, MJ tells him not to wear the red and blue costume, but to wear the black costume. So I really, I like that detail that it's, it's calling back to that. And I, I'm kind of glad that I read this before reading um, this issue. Uh, and honestly, I didn't even know this was coming out this week, but I grabbed it anyway. Uh, so I, that's a nice little little turnaround to, to add these two together like that. Um, though I do I do like Spider-Man, you know, giving up the black costume for it and everything. And, and there's a lot of good stuff in this. Um, McFarlane's art toward the end of this is brilliant as always. I was a little disappointed that his art doesn't show up till the Venom stuff starts. Um... That was that was kind of you know bothersome. Um, but I mean, to be fair, let's see. The alien costume goes away in issue two something, two fifty nine maybe. Um, hold on. The alien costume stuff ends permanently. Wait, I just had it, idiot. In issue number, they don't have the issue number. Oh, Web of Spider-Man number one, which I'm assuming happened somewhere around issue 260 of Spider-Man. But then we go to the Venom stuff next, and that's, what, almost issue 300? Yeah, issue 300 or 299 is when the Venom stuff starts up. So there's 30, 40 issues there um, where... The alien costume was stuff seemed to be done and and over with. So obviously McFarlane, you know, thirty forty issues is, is a couple of years. Um, that's at least two years. Um, well, no, that's at least three to four years rather. Uh, so McFarlane might not have been on the book yet. But I was just I was disappointed because I didn't know that. And you know, you see a Todd McFarlane cover, and obviously you want to. You want to see Todd McFarlane art. Um, and his stuff, when he does get a hold of this book, it is gorgeous. Um, I love Todd McFarlane art. Uh, God, if that man could write, he would be unstoppable. <laughs> um, it's it's cool stuff. I really like it. Uh, otherwise, spaghetti webs, yay. Um, overall, though, this, this is still enjoyable. Um... It's just, you gotta kind of check your expectations for it at the door. Um, that's the only problem with it. And, and you know, that, that's to be expected with some of these, you know, historic runs, or, or at least important character-introducing runs. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with it. It kind of just ends, which is weird. Um, like, I love the ploy Peter Parker uses to get the symbiote to come back to him and to try to leave Brock and that almost kills both Brock and the symbiote in doing so. But I don't know, it's kinda of weird that it's like he just walks away from it and that's the end of it. Like there there really needs to be a bit of an epilogue. Um which hopefully that's what I'll get in Vengeance Venom, um, where we get Carnage introduced. Uh I don't really know what to expect from Vengeance. Um, hopefully something a little better, though. Uh, that's that's all I'm really hoping for, is just to see something a little bit better than, than what we get here. Uh, oh, looks like McFarlane art to begin with, though. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that they, they now have had a little time to realize just how popular the character Venom was and to, to refine their writing. My expectations might already be too high. It was the 90s. Um... <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway so yeah that that'll be my trade talk for next week hopefully um maybe have to push back another week we'll see what happens i'm going out of town this weekend might not have a chance to read much of it um spider-man 3 is a movie you should not watch anyway i think that'll do it uh like i say always please leave in the comments below any uh ongoing books you would like me to pick up and talk about i'd be perfectly happy to um, or trades that you'd like me to keep an eye out for. I'm still looking around at, at different shops for, um, Godzilla, the Half Century War. There we go. Slip my mind for a sec. I'm still looking around at different shops for that. Um, you know, I'm going to, 
I promise I'll get to it as soon as I get to it. It's just a matter of finding it. I got one comic shop in town that I haven't gotten to yet, um, but hopefully they'll have it. Otherwise, I'll have to order it off Amazon. It's just I'm waiting to do that until I know for sure it's not here in town. So, um, yeah, that's that's still on my list. I still promise to get to it. Um, there was something about Godzilla in Hell in the uh, in the IDW in the Green Lantern Star Trek book. Um, so I might I might add that to my pull list. Um, just because Bill infected me with a an interest in Godzilla, even though I think most of it's pretty bad. Um, no offense. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, everyone, thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Zidbar2, and I'll be reviewing comic books, apparently. Bye.